Welcome back, everybody. Um, our world could certainly use more joy right now. And I am incredibly excited to welcome an actor who embodies it. Uh, please welcome to the program, Dan Payne. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing very well. Um, I love the fact that uh, you're a Canadian actor. I have so many you know, friends and so many actors uh, that are coming out to my show who are Canadian actors. And you know, no offense to my American counterparts, because I am a, an American actor, but we seem to have much more fun in our conversations with the Canadian actors. <laughs> Uh, well, you can't take anything too seriously, right? We got to have fun. What we're, whatever we're doing, we better enjoy it. I, I think so too. And again, coming to the to the joy part, right? So you've been at this for a little while, <laughs> twenty years, uh, and uh, you know, one hundred and eighteen uh, IMDb credits. And acting, you know, for those people who've been on set, know just how long that process is. And for you, who spends a lot of time. Uh, you know, in the chair getting makeup or prosthetics or anything else put on that, uh, you know, half or more of your projects are doing. Do you still have that joy and excitement for the craft after, you know, this long period of time? Uh, well, hopefully this is the first time you've heard it, but anybody who might follow an interview of mine might know that my motto, and it still okay. hasn't changed, is any day on set is a great day. Perfect. So if I'm getting makeup put on at three in the morning that takes five hours, I'm still doing something that I love to do and a part of a process with a bunch of people who also love doing what they do. So you, I really, you cannot complain. You just, you cannot yeah. forego the fact that we're all doing a creative magic thing with each other for others. It's a, uh, it's a big group of community based awesomeness in my mind. Yeah, I agree. So what, again, kind of uh, piggybacking what you said when you're in that chair, cause I've never been in that chair. You know, I've had some makeup done, but nothing, you know, nothing to that extent. What do you do? Uh, during that time, I mean, you can you can talk to the people who are uh, applying it, but what do you do when it takes five hours? Uh, probably annoy the snot out of the makeup artists a lot of the time. But <laughs> no, I um, I, I love to get to know people. It's uh, I, I'm I really truly think I'm a people person. So it's it's a wonderful four hour uh, conversation where we get to know each other, and it's pretty intimate. I mean, they're you know they're putting stuff right around your eyes, and and you have to there's a trust that has to go on, and I think through conversation you get that level of um, camaraderie and trust and then a bit of vulnerability and you are creating something together so I guess to me it's about connecting and, and my wife if she listens to this she's like oh here's the connecting word again but I'm giving her a hard time she's amazing and we have worked from the beginning of our relationship to and will continue to on connection and it's uh, it's the fuel for my life so whether I'm connecting with a makeup artist so that we can create something together or I'm connecting with my kids to help be a better parent or whether whatever it's all about connection for me so that I mean sometimes it's four or five hours of just finding your way to connection yeah that's that's great I, I understand that so just to make sure that our wives are aligned in that regard are you the guy that when you go on vacation uh, and you're on the beach you're not there reading a book you're there talking to other people because it's interesting for you of who they are and you want to get to know them Oh my goodness. You have, I don't know if you've followed me on vacation or something, but that is exactly me. My wife will want to lay down and soak up the sun and get away from it all. Yep. And I'm up like, that guy looks interesting. Hey man, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's like, oh. You know, so yeah, people, 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 people. I love it. And uh, I'm that guy. You want to throw a football around? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go. And uh, well, I mean, that, that goes back to the other thing that you've done. And do you do that on vacation too? I mean, there's always a volleyball court around. Do you still play I do. Uh, we have a favorite getaway to Mexico and there's another guy who seems to always show up. We go there every year. It's like our little oasis sanctuary. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say where it is, but it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's a yeah, nice cool. yeah, Playa del Carmen area, Cancun sort of area uh, escape. And it's there's this Canadian guy who shows up who loves volleyball. And we mm -hmm. basically call ourselves Team Canada and play two on two tournaments. Every day we can find a challenger. So we, you know, we take on Spain, Mexico, yeah. US. I'm not going to say we're undefeated, but it's pretty close. Dan, how have I not seen you before? Because my wife and I, and when we stop recording, you and I are going to tell each other where we're going. But we've been going to Mexico to Playa del Carmen for 21 years. Amazing. Every year we've been there uh, at least one or two times. My kids call Mexico their second home. Uh, because we're, we're there all the time. How have I not seen you at the, at the resort, which I'm sure will have been on the same beach? Well, now that we, now that we have a share, I can see you and I'll know next time I see you, yeah, I'll say. But yeah, to me, I love Mexico, right? The culture, yeah. uh, 
just the kindness and the area. That area for me just yes. is amazing. Yeah, I feel I I do feel like a second home there. I know that you know, don't get I go there every year, but not right. It's just beautiful. I can't I can't get enough. I'm just worried about this year. We're, we were intending to go in November, and it's still up in the air. And I'm you know, fingers crossed the the universe and whatnot helps us get there, but only safely and and only in a smart way. I don't want to. There's no worth. Nothing's worth risking lives, health, or family in any way. So. Uh, same way. This year is the first year where we're not going. Uh, we already made the decision we're not going to go. We're hoping that maybe spring break of next year, which is our kind of the other usual time, but uh, probably not. So yeah. we'll find out. You know, hopefully in a year we'll come back uh, to Mexico because we love it. Fingers uh, crossed. Yeah. So you know, volleyball, right? So how does a you know professional volleyball player in Holland? you know, become a photographer in Australia, uh, start doing acting in, <laughs> in London, and then come back and really uh, kind of uh, have an acting career in, uh, in uh, Vancouver. How, how does that whole thing track? No idea. No, um, <laughs> it started, <laughs> I think it started out with my brother and sister and I, we traveled uh, together and moved a lot when we were younger. I think it's 16 times before I was 17. And that Wow. My dad was a workaholic and still is. Um, won't retire. Come on, dad. Retire. <laughs> um, enjoy your life. Although he enjoys working. So we would move. And every time he got promoted because he worked hard, we would go to a new town, a new place. And uh, I think that somewhat nomadic lifestyle helped my brother and sister and I become best of friends. Yeah. And we would uh, bring our own fun with us. We'd perform and entertain each other. And that, I think, planted the seed, which carried on. And when I joined up with my brother after, so sports opened up first for me. I, you know, six four, and I felt like athletics seemed to be the not not easiest route, but most accessible route. And uh, I followed it through and wound up in Holland. And then when I retired, or my body retired me, I uh, yeah, perspective. But uh, I called my brother and said, "Hey, I'm next chapter." And he's like, "Well, I'm starting a company in Australia. Let's go." So I joined him and to try and make it a long story less long um yeah we'll see i loved performing i loved being in front of an audience i loved playing volleyball where i was doing something i loved doing for the set you know internal intrinsic motivation to be the best i could be at whatever it was but the external response was intoxicating yeah. and we went and put on shows in australia and we started creating environments to further his business of, of photography so we put on shows just like club med and we kind of Mm -hmm. borrowed a lot from club med but we created our own and we did our own thing and it was you know some comedy based routines and acts that involved the audience and it created opportunities for people to be on stage when they never would be take photographs of it and have a memento but then you know i got bitten by the bug i was on stage doing it and uh my brothers uh, my sister and my brother are the two funniest human beings i know and they my brother did the comedy writing for me and i got to be sort of the the um performance monkey i guess and uh I enjoyed it. I loved it. I felt the confidence of his writing and the love of being on stage. And I carried it through. I decided to step away from Australia, go to England and get the hard yards um, of an agent there and terrible auditions because of a lesser agent and then get a booking and then move up the ladder. And finally, I got to the point where I felt I'd reached the roof or yeah. roof, whatever you want to say. Um, depends where you're from. Uh, of what I could do in the UK. Um, came back to Canada with uh, some credits and, and some credibility. Mm -hmm. And I got to jump up a few rungs on the ladder rather than being a, a complete unknown. And it was, it worked out well. And I got the best agent I could find. And it was one of the top ones in Vancouver, if not top and mm -hmm. still is in my mind. And I'm having a great time and they are, I'm still with them. It's 18 or 19 years on. Mm -hmm. And that speaks volumes to that, not only relationship, but agency and, and, to me, it's essential. Again, it goes back to people. I don't need to leave them if I could just simply have a conversation and we can, you know, shift our tack in our approach and move forward. Did I answer the question, Alan, or am I you just? Did. You did. Oh. No, that that made uh, perfect sense. Because um, again, I love know, performing. I guess. Yeah, uh, I I get that. I, I certainly understand that part of it. Uh, by the way, you know, my, my connection to volleyball and <clears throat> for those people in my audience that know that I talk about myself, obviously, they do not know this fact. So this is one of the little, you know, things that probably nobody knows except for my family. 
I used to be on the junior uh, national volleyball team for Ukraine. So when, when I was growing up, volleyball was my sport until, uh, and you know, we traveled a little bit, we did well, and then everybody, because in Ukraine they had a uh, kind of a different setup. So if you were gonna be a professional, or again, the professional amateur uh, uh, in any sport, they would put you into special school. And the special sure. school, you know, focuses primarily on the sport with other things thrown in. So we got to a point, and I, I don't remember what grade I was in, and the coach came to my dad and said, okay, so all these guys are graduating, they're gonna go to that school, your son can't go. My dad asked why, he said, well, because he's Jewish. And that was the end of my volleyball career. Because there, you know, everything is kind of, you know, it's, it, I think it's still there now, but it's, it's a, you know, a systematic racism of if you're a certain, uh, a certain religious, uh, you know, um, background, then yeah, That's you're pathetic. not going to be in that. It's, it's pathetic, but that was the end of my volleyball career. So I could have been a professional volleyball player had I only not been Jewish. So, <laughs> I, I, well, I love it. You're smiling about it now, but that it's stupid. That sucks. I don't know what else to say. That's ridiculous. That sucks. It's all right. I, I what I did after that, when I couldn't do it, is I went to ballroom dancing. And I was, you know, I was still the nerdy, geeky guy. You know, I look about the same right now. Uh, and I was there. I remember very specifically that I walked into a ballroom studio. They lined up the girls and said, pick one. And I said, okay. I'm done with volleyball. I'm going to do this now. <laughs> so, <that's>, Volley what? <laughs> yeah. You know, pick one because, you know, there are no boys in, in ballroom dancing. So, you know, for, for a boy to do ballroom dancing, everybody's excited. And I literally, for the first and the only time in my life, you know, kind of uh, had a lineup where I had to pick a girl. It is incredibly pathetic. But that was, you know, that was, that was my transition away from volleyball. Is it pathetic or genius? I, well, let's... It's hard to say. I, I certainly <laughs> thought it was genius at that time, and I, I, I pat myself on the shoulder saying, okay, no more nerd, boy. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, you say nerd. I, I like to call myself a nerd, whether it be a, my wife's like, you're a jock nerd. Because to me, nerd, is it doesn't matter what you look like or whatever. It's this, yeah. it's an attitude and approach to things, which I'm extremely proud of. Like, I will, when, when I say I'm going to nerd out on something, I'm not saying it in a negative way. I'm like, I'm going to fully engage and disappear into this thing. So that people might look at me like, whoa, but I don't really care because that's, that's just how I roll. If I love something that much, including acting, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to nerd out. And I like to consider, and I, hopefully nobody gets mad at me for saying, oh, you, you can't be a nerd. Why can you not be a nerd if you, because I'm what, too tall to be a nerd? Is there a height restriction? Like, I don't really understand unless, so anyway, and I wanted to throw one thing at you if I could, Alan. Please. Volleyball. Mm -hmm. For me, when I, the sport, because it was, I, I got coached to a really nice elite level and I found this. Um, I call it the white zone when I was a kid, but this, this place when I was playing volleyball where the world would disappear and the only thing that existed was the game that was going on and the ball and what I needed to do. And I was so engaged that, like I said, the rest of the world dropped away. It was the most euphoric, intoxicating state that I could ever imagine. And that's what drove me to continue to pursue the best I could be in volleyball. And I found that in acting. When you go into a scene, whether it be in an audition with a great reader or whether you're on set with a wonderful actor, a very generous actor, the rest of the world can disappear. And you're transformed and transported. There's the word. Big words. Uh, you're, you're transported and transformed to this character in this world. And it's, it's intoxicating. It's the greatest drug on the planet. And I will forever pursue that because it is, I think it's kept me sane. So... I'll nerd out on it until I'm told I cannot anymore for whatever, and I'll still fight it. So, yeah. Well, listen, <clears throat> I keep doing that. It's the right hand that points on this thing. It's the love of acting. That's the nerd part of me that wants to talk to everybody about it. This, I, I think, I could be a really good weatherman. You know, <laughs> I'm starting to get used to that. Um, I actually, in in NBC uh, tour when we went to New York for an NBC tour. Uh, they had us in a room where we, uh, we had a chance to try being a weatherman. It takes some getting used to. You know, I'm used to being in front of a camera. That thing is tough because you have a green screen behind you. You don't know what's happening and you have to be in the right area and you know exactly where you're going. It's not an easy thing to do. 
Yeah, I think I'll stay away from it unless I get cast as a weatherman. Well, you could be. Uh, and again, I did. I did do weatherman. You did? Way back early, I was in a Muppet movie. I never made the final cut, but Kirk Thatcher, who is a friend of mine and a wonderful, also hilarious, uh, genius director, cast me in a second movie because uh, I got to do the um, Very Merry Muppet Christmas with him. He cast me in the next one he did as a weatherman. And I got to hang uh, on wires like I was in the middle of a hurricane. It's gone to level five and uh, a lot of fun. The footage exists somewhere, I think he said. But yeah, I never made the final edit. Oh, well, hopefully you get an opportunity. It's, it's, uh, it's fun. But you've done your share of green screen. Uh, you've, you've done that before. So. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm being able to dance in all aspects of it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, green screen on uh, on King Shark uh, um, uh, on Flash uh, in 2019. I think that's where you had uh, uh, an episode there. I think there's you know a, a lot of visual effects and green screen and all sorts of things happening there. Yeah, well, the CGI and it's a that fight in that episode alone blew my mind. You know, because I didn't, I physically wasn't there. Sorry if I'm spoiler alert, but <laughs> that amazing fight obviously was CGI, and it was for an episodic TV series. I think pretty spectacular i agree I yeah know. so i mean it, it made me even more honored to be shay landon slash king shark because i'm watching that and i'm like yeah that's me <clears throat> kids that's your dad yeah yeah so uh, you know, <clears throat> any any nicknames uh, after that you know kids uh, kids treat you different or uh, you know it doesn't matter well not from that one uh the disney descendants i used to joke that i'd go into beast mode yes so they, they joke, they're like, I get all upset. And so I'm like, guys, you've got it. You know, and they're like, oh, is this, is this beast mode, dad? It's, yep. yep. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Well, they bring you down. Uh, this is where my kids know you from, by the way, is from, uh, is from Descendants. Um, you know, I saw you there. I've seen you in other stuff before, but I think Descendants was, uh, was kind of my kid's introduction to you. And then they saw you as King Shark uh, uh, later on Flash. Um, that's, that's Descendants is, is a great project. And uh, uh, again, anytime I mention Descendants, I, I start getting sad because of, of Cam uh, you know, passing away. It's, but it was, it's just a really, really beautiful story. And I loved how they did it. Um, I'm so sad that Cam is not going to be a part of it anymore. But um, yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, I, I, I'm honored to have been there uh, and been a part of it. I'm honored to have known and being able to share some time with Cameron. He was literally, sometimes you can't believe all the hype uh, mm -hmm. that with that young man, you actually could. He was a huge hearted, philanthropic, mm -hmm. sweet, genuinely talented beyond a comprehension in every practice you can imagine. He could sing, dance, act. Uh, it, it was, he was a very special young man and it was heartbreaking and it still is it still weighs heavy on everybody who, whose lives he touched, including all the fans. And for me, I, I'm very aware of um, Descendants putting me on the map in terms of a fan base and whatnot. And I'm so grateful because they are so supportive and so um, forthcoming and sharing and, and wonderful, like just amazing. The fan base from Descendants is, is otherworldly. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, at first I have a wonderful uh, fan base from from stargate and sci-fi from the wonderful uh, uh, yep. efforts i've been able to put in there and then I, there's the gay community is still extremely supportive from a movie i did a long time ago called mulligans and i'm mm -hmm. so grateful that the longevity of that support is is mind-blowing so I, i'm very but descendants was huge it was a big jump and uh, i had the very good fortune i put a video online because i i had filmed cam just singing and strumming along with i think it was either Sarah Jeffrey or Brenna, I think it was Brenna D'Amico. And it was his voice, the two of them. I was just, I couldn't help it. I'm like, I want to capture this exquisite improv of just joy that can be shared with the world. And, it, and I'm so glad because it was very well received for what it was. A wonderful expression of the beauty and talent of Cam and the other castmates. And... Uh, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I get to see it now and again. It comes up in my feed, and it'll just give me a little pang of joy and pain at the same time. You know, I mean, yeah. if I'm going to be honest, it is joy because there was he was such a – his smile was electric. And then the sadness that that smile maybe won't be able to shine again in in, in living color. I mean, it will in, in his past work. But anyway, don't want to get too down. 
Yeah. He was a great kid. It's, it, it's, yeah. Um, it's one of those things, right? You, some, uh, some people, and we just had this with, uh, with Chadwick uh, passing, you know, some people who are so great, who are so incredible, you know, as artists and as people, uh, for some reason, you know, a number of them, a good number of them in every generation, these kind of icons, uh, they go away way too soon. I don't know what it is. It just, it's, it's a life thing. Uh, Chadwick, like their voice speaks louder and with greater volume than, than others. Yeah. For some it factor reason, they reach connect to more people on a grander scale than others. And we need it, you know, and it, and it's, we need it when they're there and it's a, it's a horrible sadness when they go, but the, beauty of the legacy that each of them leaves behind for communities, for art, for everything that they touched is essential. It's essential for the healing of the world. It's essential for the growth and awareness of the world. It's the impact is huge. And I'm, you know, I'm glad they had the time that they did to do what they could do. And in passing have a legacy that's going to live on. It's yeah. thankfully, impressive. It's all on camera, so we get a chance to uh, to to be with them forever, and that's that's the you know silver lining in that. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, going back to descendants uh, and kind of on, the, on a happier note, but you know you do a lot of uh, roles where we don't get to see your face. You know uh, you do a lot of that, and we'll come back into it because uh, uh, aspects of it are extremely interesting to me and to other actors uh, who are watching this. But what um, you know, do you enjoy, I guess that's the question. So do you enjoy being behind the mask or just being you and, uh, and being able to play as yourself without having prosthetics or makeup or, you know, being outworldly in a way? Uh, that's a big question. And I like, I'll go back to my motto that every day on set's a great day. But, uh, as I'm, as I'm getting older, I do, Starting out, it didn't, it didn't matter what it was. I was grateful to experience and learn whatever that thing was. And it just so happened that my physicality, my physical and athletic background, and my ability to act all combined quite well to do and create creatures. And the creatures often had prosthetic, yep. bury my face. Um, so half my paycheck's going to therapy for the complex they gave me. But, um, you know, just a wonderful uh, ability to, create in a different way because uh some of them were aliens there is no preset for an alien mm -hmm. so you get to collaborate with the directors and producers and create this new creature and then there's werewolves and um i mean i can't the, the list goes on a, a alien and aliens ate my homework the most recent uh alien stole my body movie with sean mcmahon yeah. so much fun that was a comedy based uh kids movie mm -hmm. with Sean giving us, he gave me the freedom to ad lib and fart around and have fun. And I like, that's the greatest gift ever. And to be hidden behind that mask in some respects mm -hmm. and to know that there's no precedent set, that's pretty, a pretty unique situation, which gives you a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy that. But as I get older, the four o'clock in the morning, five hour makeup, um, it's pretty tedious. I, I have to be honest and kudos to everybody who goes through it. And I've done it a lot. I'm mm -hmm. looking more now to not do it as much as I am to do it. But I'll still say yes to pretty much anything because yeah. any day on set. <laughs> but yeah, all day to have somebody gluing the little piece of your eye back down and, and spray painting. And then, oh, we got to set it with this stuff. Don't breathe. And then you're underneath usually quite a bit of uh, latex and rubber and it's hot and your suit is unique and you can't take it off because it hides the... So there, there's a lot to do and it is grueling and... It, I think at the end of the day, when you get through it, it's not like banging your head. It's fun to stop banging your head. But at the end of the day, to me, as, as hard as that day was, I'm still experiencing something I wouldn't ever get the chance to. And when I get to look back and reflect, as hard as that day might have been, the joy of the learning from that day still outweighs any kind of, let's call it torture, <laughs> that I went through. Yeah, yeah, because in a way it is. Again, I, in the only prosthetic that I had, or the only kind of uh, thing that I had to do is I had a scar kind of going down my head. So that didn't take a long time, but I had to be so careful. And I had to, you know, as I'm acting, I have to constantly be aware of what I'm touching and how I'm touching just to make sure that it doesn't go away. 
you know, you do that you know, on, a, on a much grander scale. So I can certainly appreciate how, uh, how much mental uh, energy it's, it's taking just to make sure that you're not only acting, but you're aware of all of the things that you're not supposed to do in it. And not to sound like this, I always say this, but it's, it's true. I couldn't do what I do without the amazing team behind you. Like you need to have the freedom and trust and confidence that you can go in and do whatever you need to do to tell the story. And if that means you're jeopardizing, you know, making a tear in the suit or whatever, yeah. if you don't do that, you deny the story and then the director's not getting what he needs and then the story's not being told the way it needs to be told. So the beauty of what I get to do is often supported immeasurably like it's unbelievable by the crew and people that created the suit and then therefore put it on and keep it do the upkeep it's it's mind-blowing you know they do come in and do the touches because you need to keep that suspension of disbelief complete and yeah. full throughout the entire effort but on the other hand and again i I'm, I'm only imagining because i haven't done that but it would seem uh because some actors create from within some actors, they need to put something on and then it starts really kind of seeping in and dictating what the character is going to be like. Uh, the, you know, Charlie Chaplin discovering the, uh, the character uh, by putting on the clothes. And by the time he was done, he knew who the character was. Uh, right. With you, you know, applying and get, not you applying it, but with uh, you being in so much of that uh, uh, prosthetics and makeup and everything else, that hopefully helps you get into the character and make choices because of what it is on the outside. hundred percent. When you, so a lot of it for me, I'll read the script and I'll get an idea of the, the mentality, the personality, the attitude, uh, create a background and all that for this unique alien or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But that still doesn't mean the finishing touches on that won't come from the external. So I, I like to do a lot of internal and come through it that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, there's no way you, can afford not to look in the mirror and move your face around with this new face that you've just been given. Yeah. And with all the things that I worked out before, like ugh, if I'm angry, is angry enough to just be stern or do I have to, you know, it, and these things are right to your face. Anything I do translates to these masks and these, yeah. these creatures. So it's the freedom to create is full. And uh, I do, I spend a lot of time, I'll go back to my trailer and I'm, I'm just in there making faces at myself. Yeah. And having fun, like just having fun being blue or green or whatever, whatever I happen to be. Uh, and, and create from the outside, like that's now informing me on the inside. So the two can mesh up. I think both uh, disciplines come into play when you do creature work. And that's a great, that's really cool that you mentioned that because I didn't really look at it that way. I always go from the inside out. And, uh, um, I, you know, it's not the clothes because I feel like the clothes are going to come when I go to fittings and that, I don't get as much freedom that way to choose. So this is one where it's going to be the same. Like I'm going to be the same blue guy every day I show up on set. So that's going to be informing me yeah. more so than the first effort of the inside out. Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah, I, I know myself, forget costumes, forget acting, but when I put on a suit, you, you uh, kind of hold yourself in a different way when I'm just, you know, playing tennis, uh, which is my sport, uh, you know, mostly is you feel different and it's like all of that allows you to uh <clears throat> to you know work within yourself and express parts of yourself that kind of rise uh, a little more than the other ones so you know putting on a suit or putting on their prosthetic uh if i were looking in the mirror it certainly would dictate a lot of things to me i imagine for sure you'd be crazy not to let everything be information for you yeah like I call it mining for gold, but you read the script, the other characters are going to help you understand your character better. All the, even the stage directions, whether you actually end up doing them or not, are in helping you inform physicality, mentality, approach to things. It's all, it's all mining for gold. And, and uh, you know, putting on a blue face prosthetic is a, a, a gold mine of, of that gold. So I, yeah, it, you know, the suit, like you said, even when I'm me, when I put on a suit, I've done the work on the inside. So the suit helps me reiterate, confirm, and uh, solidify my purpose for that element of the character and whatnot. Absolutely. And, you know, you bring up suits. I have to bring up suits because that's one of my favorite shows ever. It was shot in Canada. I think, although, was it Vancouver or Toronto? Uh, I, I don't remember exactly where they shot it. 
uh, the USA uh, show Suits. Um, Toronto, I think. It was, uh, where? In Toronto, right? I think it's Toronto, yeah. Yeah, a lot of my, you know, Canadian actor friends have been on that uh, show and have done uh, kind of episodes. And actually, speaking of Canada, and I want to go back uh, and, and continue discussing some of the other stuff we we're talking about, but speaking of Canada, I'm in a secondary market myself. I'm in Chicago. So uh, again, no offense to Chicago, but we are a secondary market. We're not LA, we're not New York. That's, that's it. So uh, when I talk to my Canadian friends, uh, I used to hear the same thing that I heard you mentioned before of, you want to get a job in Vancouver, you have to move to LA. Uh, so you stayed in Vancouver. You know, uh, were, you, were you, I think satisfied may be a wrong word, but were you satisfied with the amount of work that you were getting and the type of work that you said, I don't need to go there? Or did you have the temptation of, I need to go to LA? I've always had the temptation. Um, but yeah, thanks for mentioning. So I have an amazing wife and two exquisite kids. Yeah. And they are always, as much as this pursuit of acting and my absolute love of acting, they're the priority. And not, I, again, this is why I say I'm a nerd, because this is how I am. I just literally, that's my priority. Um, my wife is so great that if I booked a series in, I don't know, Atlanta, she'd be like, have fun, hon. I'll, we'll come down when we can. Like, she's super supportive that way. But at the time, when we were having kids and, and working on our relationship, um, we put roots down here in Vancouver and for me to go down there with her having uh, us having a brand new baby and just leaving her with him would have been selfish and I, not that I'm she was supportive of it but I wanted to pick my battles and pick my time and I have an one visa now and I've had no one visa for five years and will continue to keep it because I still feel a call and I feel a draw and I still feel I have a lot of life left in me in this in this industry and in this career yeah. That should that door open, I'm gone. And I've got the support and my kids are older now and there's less, uh, I mean, it's it, oh, shift, it's changed, but there's less of a demand for me to be here for um, the extended amount of time I could leave in order to pursue a series or whatever. So I found work in Vancouver. I was very fortunate and I'm grateful and very aware of the fact that to be able to be a working actor and be a provider for a family as an actor mm -hmm. is pretty, to be able to say that is pretty amazing and I'm grateful and I'm fully aware and honored to be able to say that. That being said, there's always more. And maybe that's the drive that I feel. And that's because I truly love this. Like I, this there's, it's in my DNA. There's no people go, what would you do if you weren't acting? I'm like acting. I don't really like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't want to think about it. I don't have a plan B. Uh, there's my plan B is find a new way to act. Um, so, so that, I mean, to answer the question, yes, I found enough work. I found a uh, love and continued love of being able to do what I do while supporting and, and being on and honoring my family. And I've gone to LA pilot seasons a couple of times. I've tested a few times. I've had great experiences as of yet. It hasn't stuck. I still have every ounce of my heart being and DNA says it will. So I'm going to keep going. I think it will. And uh, again, Vancouver is a wonderful acting community. I hear nothing but incredible things about it. And uh, the work that they're doing, again, talking about the CGI, you know, I think a lot of it is done in Vancouver. So yep. uh, it's, it's a great place. I, I, I really like it. Uh, I've never worked in Vancouver because for us, uh, you really have to kind of uh, get a project and then be, uh, be put in Canada. Yep. Uh, I'm not at that level, but I look forward to an opportunity. Shall it come up? Absolutely. And by the way, I love Chicago. I get to do, well, pre-pandemic, I got to go to Chicago every year for seven years for an autograph convention for sci-fi shows. That's awesome. And I have, not that the other ones weren't great, but that was my favorite of all of them. I just had a blast. Chicago, the five corners, um, everything is just, I love Chicago. What a great town. Yeah. Um, Chicago, again, I've been to Toronto a number of times and I've been to Vancouver, just not from the acting perspective, but Chicago reminds me of, uh, of, uh, of Toronto in a way because mm, you have the lakefront, you have the downtown area. So until you kind of go farther in Toronto, you really uh, have a feeling of Chicago right there in the downtown area. Uh, Vancouver to, to an extent. But my, by the way, my gripe with Vancouver, not that anybody cares about it, but my gripe with Vancouver is that it's an incredibly pretty city. You have just gorgeous city, but you also tend to have some rain. 
why not add some color to, uh, to your skyline? Why not have the buildings uh, be in multiple colors? Because when it's gray and it's dreary, your buildings are reflecting that. Why not add more color? And I think it'll be even better. I'll talk to city council. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, well, I actually love the, the fact that it rains means that everything's green. We're green year round. I do, I, you know, yes, every once in a while, I feel like I'm going to start growing gills and my feet are going to web, but uh, I don't mind it. I'll, I'll pass up the, yeah, right. Wow, I can breathe underwater. Um, I don't mind it though, because it keeps everything at wonderfully green. And I felt like I, if I'm being fully transparent, I had a little bit of a, not negative, but just, less appreciation less of an appreciation of toronto until i got to film a, a the series good witch there for a full season mm -hmm. I, that that whole season and that time in toronto helped me recognize the beauty of toronto and what it has to offer so now when people are like i'm going to toronto I'm like oh cool versus you're leaving here why right i just like why would you leave vancouver well now i get it there's you know it's to to each their own there's different amazing elements to toronto that i didn't i wouldn't have known had i not had that opportunity to film there yeah uh, that whole Pacific Northwest, I love it. Uh, I, I don't know <clears throat> if we're ever going to move, but uh, we certainly love visiting that part of, uh, of the uh, world. Um, talking about physicality and talking about longevity, and uh, not that you're an old guy at all, you know, because you're just a few years older than I am, but in terms of physicality and, yeah, well, people know. Um, <laughs> and you do a lot of stunts, you know, on, on a lot of projects, you do stunts. Um, I, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not um, saying what your wife may be telling you, but if, if I'm channeling my wife at the moment, I think I would hear a voice in my head of, okay, you get to a point where you should stop doing stunts. So have that conversation, uh, has that have conversation uh, happened already? It has, yeah, it's funny, it is. Uh... So first of all, I want to throw kudos out again, being a nerd, because I, I don't know any other way. Yep. Kudos to the stunt community. I'm an actor who's been very fortunate to do stunts. Right. There, are a, there is a stunt community, community that trains to do stunts and are mind-blowingly amazing at it. That's their living and that's their, and it's a lifestyle. I am afforded a wonderful opportunity by beautiful stunt coordinators and fellow stunt people who adopt and allow me to come into that world uh, intermittently because of my physicality and my, I guess, willingness to learn and, and hopefully be coachable having had that uh, previous sports experience. And I'm hoping that's what it is, not just a punching bag. Like, Dan's dumb enough to say yes, um, which is true, but hey. Uh, no, the, you know, my biggest, the diff most difficult thing I have in this industry is saying no. But that being said, I've experienced some colossal, um, like being on the Warcraft stunt team for five, five and a half months. Yeah crazy to watch that whole project and to me that as much as I was doing stunts I was also getting to watch the process and see people that I admire and respect do what they do and try and sponge off them there's no like downtime sure physically you're beaten up because you're running around and, and you're trying to be a giant ogre and orc sorry and um, when I'm sitting there I'm not just like oh my gosh when do we get to eat uh, type thing I'm actually watching the other actors do their thing and listening to the director and watching the DP and, and trying to sponge up because if you truly love the art and you truly love it, then there's something to learn from every aspect that will feed and, and inform you of your piece of that creative pie. So it's, it, stunts is just another aspect to help me understand better what it is I love and why I love doing it. Yeah. You are in Minus the broken ribs and concussions. Yeah. Uh, you are a nerd. I, I think I'm going to name this interview, you know, acting nerd or something like that, because it, it has to come up. And hopefully people will understand the right way that we mean by that. Uh, yes, it's fully, uh, uh, we're celebrating the term. Like, Yeah, because I heard the other thing that you were saying, of, you know, like when you were doing um, uh, Star Trek, uh, Star Trek uh, uh, Beyond, right? I think that's the one. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you again, you were you know, kind of behind the mask, if you will. But I heard you saying in your interviews uh, during my uh, you know never ending prep, which I enjoy tremendously, is that you had an opportunity to really just watch and watch Chris Pine and watch Idris Elba and watch all these people uh, work. And for you as the acting nerd to kind of be that sponge and to learn, this is why like I want to be on Billions 
just put me in a corner somewhere and just let me watch. I want that because that's all I care about. I just want to see them. So you get an opportunity to do that. I think that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for doing all your prep. That's really cool. But the, it, so for me, I, I've been, after doing it for two decades now, I'm in a position, I feel and I hope to be a good coach. And, and I, I teach an acting class here in Vancouver and I coach actors one-on-one -on -one prep for auditions and stuff, which awesome. is equally as fun. It's a different, like, again, it's a different part of the same pie. And uh, it gives me the same euphoric joy watching revelations, whether it be mine or theirs. Mm -hmm. But speaking of process and helping others with their process, that's what that does for me is it helps me with my process. Idris Alba is mind blowing. Like no two takes were the same. He, I was only with him briefly for, uh, I don't know, three days. And you're only doing maybe in those three days, two pages or something mm -hmm. uh, on a feature. Not, oh, I, I'm just flashing back to it. He'd come in, we were captives, we were in a cell and he would come in and he'd take over the cell and he's trying to find this item and we have one of our crew members has it in their alien, um, yeah, anyway, yeah. for those watching the movie. I, I had to make sure that I was paying enough attention to not get lost in his process and performance and have them be like, uh, yeah, pain, yeah, fo you're, you missed your mo line, great. Let's go again, right, because he is, it was never the same. Like you were on your toes and you, if you want to be a good actor, you want to be the best support for whatever it is in whatever capacity for that scene. Mm -hmm. So he keeps you on your toes. You better pay attention. He, one time it didn't make the final cut, but I, I'm supposed to stand up to him. I'm a big security officer. I'm all beefed up and I've got this gnarly face, which was amazing. So I front up to him and I growl and I stand up in my full height and he batted me in the head. And it was just the improv thing. He's like, you know, like just, you're nothing. It was this beautiful thing. And I'm like, oh. And I cower back down. And I'm like, that is exquisite. And, and maybe when you're looking at me, you're like, you are a nerd again. But that's a moment. And I got to have a moment with an artist that I think is exquisite. And I wasn't caught out and I wasn't lost. And so for anything, just for me to be present was, was a gift to know that that's part of the focus and, and what it takes whilst being among g genius. You know, like it just is, was bringing genius. Yeah. Am I done spewing? Yes, I'm sorry. But he is, it was just exquisite. Like, uh, I, can I do it again? Do I have to go through five hours of makeup again? Sure, let's do it. Because that, that's the kind of thing that you, I, <laughs> you can win. I've won a couple of awards and I'm grateful. But those moments, as great as they are, they're on par with these moments that I have with genius artists who I get to spend a second with, you know? That's awesome. I, I totally understand. And uh, by the way, never stop uh, talking or geeking out about it because that's, I, I think if, if we in Mexico, if we ever get together, I, I think our wives are going to be very upset because there's just going to be never ending conversation about all of this stuff. Or they'll be happy. They'll like go to the bar, leave us alone. That is true. And we'll that's, be happy. So yeah, maybe it'll be win-win. The, the boys are going to be playing. I think it could work actually. So <laughs> why don't we team up? We'll make a volleyball team, team Canada, Ukraine. Sure. and uh, we'll challenge away and we'll talk. We'll just talk and play volleyball. It's done, yeah. covered. And you're a lefty, I'm a righty. You know, I am nowhere at, at your level because I stopped playing much earlier uh, and I'm not sure I was that talented to begin with, but I'm, I can definitely hold my own. We're, in, in Canada, we have beer league hockey where we all think we're playing in our NHL. It's just what you feel. <laughs> I can barely jump over my big toe anymore. That used to be my big thing. I could jump out of the gym. Now it's like clearing my big toes in effort, so see this what people also don't understand again you you, you grew up uh, in Canada but when I uh, when I started playing volleyball there were no knee pads in Ukraine they didn't give you knee pads right so we didn't have a ball what I was when I was learning how to set we were learning how to set with a sock that we put some sand in it and that's that's what we used to use this was not that long ago and that's what we had when I came to the United States and then I went to the secondhand sports uh, you know, store and I saw all of that stuff, I almost started crying because you really learn the importance of, of properly, you know, properly diving when you don't have knee pads. I wish I had knee pads at that time. <laughs> you got raspberries all over your knees and hips oh to prove it. 
Uh, yeah, just, you know, when, when you're blocking, you have something hit and you're like, oh, did I just dislocate? No, I think it's all right. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> oh, I've come down and had this finger sticking out sideways and you're like, oh, yeah. that's unfortunate. Or, they just snap it back in and tape it to the one next to it and then go have fun, go get in there. Yeah, no, I- We're not I, paying you to whine. I love right. volleyball. It's, it's, it's a great sport. Um, I miss it. When, when you're teaching and going back to acting, uh, when you're teaching and talking about auditions, um, you know, some of the auditions that you had that you were talking about, uh, you know, it was a while ago, but now with the whole kind of Me Too uh, movement and with you being a, you know, tall, good looking guy, um, you mentioned a particular instance where, you know, uh, you were supposed to be a swimmer. This was for a commercial, I think you were talking about. Oh yeah, Guinness in England. Yeah, and um, actually, why don't you tell that story, and then I'll ask my question after it. Yeah, maybe I should. I, mean, I don't know if I've said too much, but anyway, uh, so I'd just been <laughs> too late. Um, so I was in England. I was just starting out, and I went to an audition for a commercial uh, to be a diver off a high cliff diver for a very popular beverage. And uh, I went in, and there was a, a meek uh, cameraman in the corner who – barely made eye contact and then this surprise like very attractive lady mm -hmm. on the couch mm -hmm. um and we had to wear a robe and strip down to our underwear and uh i mean intimidating to begin but it, you're meant to be a diver and, and a swimmer so there wasn't it wasn't and i don't even know if they could do that anymore but it wasn't offside you weren't like that's weird because we, they provided robes we had change rooms it wasn't like stripped down in the in the mm -hmm. front room they had a a change room and a robe uh, well, we couldn't do that now because we all shared the same robes. But anyway, um, thinking back, that's kind of gross. But uh, we, you know, switch it. <laughs> yeah. So I go in in my in my uh, boxer briefs, and you have to drop the robe in front of, and there's just this one woman in there, and uh, again, pretty young, pretty new, and she's like, "Okay, can you raise your hands over your head like you're about to dive, and then give me a 360?" And I was like, uh, "Okay, yeah." So I I do it, and she's like, "Oh, that's that's quite impressive." Are you, yeah, and again, you're like, well, it didn't seem offside. I was just like, okay, cool, I, I, you know, from my lack of experience, I'm like, I guess it's going well, I don't know. And she said, um, what are you doing for the shoot dates between such and such and such and such? I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm completely free. And then she goes, good. And what are you doing this Friday? I was like. It's just so wrong. Uh, I. And I'm, yeah, I don't know if I'm just dumb or naive, but I was like, I not, I don't know yet. Yeah. Um, you know, and you know, from there I was like, oh, and I left. And then I, again, I hate being this naive or had, having been that naive. I didn't really recognize yeah. what had happened and that it was, you know, inappropriate and whatever. And yeah, so that was the experience. So have you had things like that? or similar to it i mean i know you get uh, to be uh, you get asked to put, to take your shirt off uh, in in a lot of uh, a lot of your productions um but have you seen that the industry is getting to a point where you know they're being a lot better about it and less inappropriate or you found that you know they the you know certain people view you in a certain way and uh they are okay with it um i, I think it's gotten infinitely better there's so they have a coach now they have a um as they do a stunt coordinator they now have a a physicality coach i'm not sure what the term is and i wish i knew it but there's somebody who help you and the other actor through any kind of love scene or any kind of intimacy intimacy coach yeah an intimacy coach i believe that's the term which is genius so before they had intimacy coaches i had the good fortune of either having somebody mentor me to to the awareness or whether it was just, you know, through the relationship with my wife and stuff to understand that you need to, I think it was both, a bit of both, that you have to have parameters. And each of you has to understand the parameters for one another in order to have the safety, comfort, and ability to get to that vulnerable state to tell the story. To know that if you're going to be intimate in some way, what's okay, what's not okay? Where can I put my hands? Where can't I? What, what do you feel comfortable with that will tell the story in a way that you feel is honoring the script and yourself? And I loved that because that conversation you have with the fellow actor or actress um because i had i mean i of the mulligans movie it, it was a, had to be discussed um 
a few other projects that I've had the good fortune to be, it has to be discussed. And we did it on, on our own beforehand. And then we also are now united fronts uh, against sometimes producers who want more. And it hasn't, it's not in the script where they're like, hey, we'd like this to spice it up a little bit. Do you mind guys going down to your whatever underwear or could you be topless and just be touching body to body? We won't see anything, but, it, and you're like, Ugh. well, that's fine for me, but it's, you're now asking a woman to be naked and touching a man she just met maybe that day if we're shooting that first up, that's not cool or fair. So it's really nice to have those parameters because you can both go, mm, no, that's not what we discussed. And she knows I've got her back. I, I know she's got mine. And we, I, I liked that. But now there's an intimacy coach and you don't have that responsibility on you. The good cop, bad cop can come out where, because at that point you might be looked at as, because there's pressure at times. Mm -hmm. To be honest, there's always pressure and you have to be able to, you know, have your self-awareness and integrity intact to be able to stand up for what you need to. And other times it's just creative process and they're helping you push to a new, level and boundary yeah. that's acceptable but that's good. now you don't have to be the bad cop and go no i'm not doing that and they're like oh, you're ruining the production now the intimacy coach goes that's unacceptable it's not a part of the pre-production contract so you can't ask for that and you're like okay great thanks yeah that that no uh, that's better um and from you know being a family man and being married uh how did those conversations uh, go with your wife uh you know I'm, I'm, I'm an actor where my wife didn't see me on a big screen and, uh, you know, the things that I have done, uh, she doesn't have to worry about me being the romantic lead and I uh, have those conversations. You've had those conversations. Uh, how do they go? <laughs> this is kudos to my wife yet again. I think I had more trouble with it than she did That's in good. that I would read the script and be like, uh, babe, there's a, there's a makeout scene or whatever in, in this script. And I just, um, because I understand the industry and, and I know that it's part of telling a story. I always felt that she, there might be an, a, a disconnect with her understanding that it's part of telling a story. And, and she was, she's like, okay. And I, I wait for, she's like, uh, oh, is there a bad part? I don't understand. Like, what are you, what are you trying to say? Good luck. Uh, you're, you're a great kisser. What do you want? You know, I'm like, oh, okay. so you're, you're good with it. And she's like, yeah. Oh God. If that's your question, then you, yeah, you're an idiot. Uh, no, she didn't say that. She, <laughs> I felt like that, but the, the beauty of it is she was, she is that supportive of the storytelling that it's that's part good. of the story and do your best. And she was like, literally, she's like, you're a great kisser. You'll be fine. Oh, you're worried about me seeing you kiss someone else. Like, no problem. It's just like, if I catch you at a cafe and it's not a camera thing, I'll kill you. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, so there's, there was a conversation, but it was my side was the, the awkward side. And she was like, go get it. Okay. Hey, uh, uh, you know, kudos to your wife. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know what my conversation will be like and if I ever will get to have it because I don't get cast in a romantic lead. Um, so, so far, so good. No need to have <laughs> Very Yeah, good. well, I hope that that conversation and pact I have with my wife carries on and I get another reason to have to just have that quick little conversation because yeah I, I hope so um in terms of your hallmark let's do uh, this yeah <laughs> let's do it um in terms of uh, in terms of your kids yeah I know you have uh, two boys um who are you know growing up if have they expressed interest in uh, in the acting world or uh, I guess I'll leave it at that and then I'll jump into with another question sure uh to some extent and again, conversations within the family. I've always said, I'm never going to push them to do anything, right. whether it be sport or acting. If they express a love for it or an interest in it, I will then support them 110%. But I'm not going to drag them to auditions. My, my older son said, I'd like to do what you do, dad. I think it'd be cool. I'm like, awesome, bud. I teach a class. And if you want to sit in and hear what it's about and, and see what you feel about the nature of work involved, Mm -hmm. then let's move forward. But he's never really, and I'm not gonna be like, Hey, I've told him, Hey, I'm teaching class. If you want to sit in and listen. And he's like, uh, no, I'm okay. So to me, that means, cause you have to have passion. This industry will eat you up. It'll chew you up and spit you out. If you don't have the passion to get through the nose and the rejection mm -hmm. and the insecurity and the, the, the sometimes financial, uh, insecurity like there's a lot going on that you best love every aspect of it enough to carry through those tough times yeah 
So if you're not willing to sit through a class, I'm not going to put you through the, cause you can go to an audition and sit for an hour. And if you don't truly want to get that role and get your hat in the ring for it, you're going to go in with a grumpy attitude and a negativeness that will read immediately and you're done. Yeah. So you best know that it might be an hour and I can't wait to get in and get my chance. You know? I know. And I mean, it's again, it's in Chicago. I know LA and New York, it's the same thing, but in Chicago, I live in the Northwest suburbs for me to go to an audition downtown. I'm going to be driving for about an hour plus. I will sit there waiting for my two minute or three minute audition. And then I will drive an hour and a half back, usually in traffic, which adds it to maybe two hours. So yep. if you don't love it, why the hell are you doing it? You have got to love it. That passion is your fuel to carry on. Right. And my brother and I, so again, I've got mottos, right? Mine is every, any day on set's a great day. And then my brother and I had one uh, through sports and that's carried on is get up one more time and then they knock you down. That, that's the key to success and, and or one of them. But that's that's been a great source for me. I have a tattoo on my foot that's related to that um, for, for my brother and I. And it, it's essential. This this industry is, is tough. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And it, to know that is you should, you know, if you're working as an actor, whether it be once or a hundred times, doesn't matter. Just know that if you've gotten a job that you've surpassed that, very difficult aspect of being chosen in a one in a million type of a process to get to that moment. Absolutely. Uh, let's uh, talk about, you know, some great people that you had a chance to work with. And actually, let's just talk about one in particular, because you already mentioned some of the other ones. Uh, but, you know, my whole family is, is uh, flash uh, everything. And, uh, you know, I, I I'm going to embarrass my daughter right now, but she had a crush on Grand Gustin when she was growing up. So, uh, Grant, if you're if you're watching this, I know you're married, and uh, you know my daughter grew out of it, but now you know. So, <clears throat> the being on on Flash and uh, being King Shark, and actually kind of combining two things. I know a lot of it was CGI, but you had some parts with the CGI, and then you had parts where it was just you. Um, you know how cool was that, and how cool was it working with Grand Gustin, who from Everybody that I hear uh, is saying is just a genuine, beautiful human being. I will reiterate that first thing foremost. Grant Gustin is one of the, he is the quintessential number one. It starts from the top down and his attitude that's Tony sets, his work ethic and his wonderful, just kind, brilliantly sweet and genuine demeanor mm -hmm. is remarkable. It's so I had to jump in the freezing cold water of the um, ocean in winter uh, here. And I feel, I'll say this, the cast crew, stunt team, and everybody were unbelievably supportive. And even with the amazing amount of support I had, Grant was still the top shelf guy checking in on me. He would come down, are you okay? Are you sure you want to do this? Are you warm enough? Is there anything I can get you? He is as sweet as he as you can possibly imagine. I've seen interviews of him just because I, you know, I think I have a crush on him to some extent. He's just a great guy. Oh, and right. And so I've watched interviews just to, just to hear and maybe reinforce, like, is he actually as great a human being as he seemed when I, yes, he freaking is. And then on top of that, to be able to be a named uh, villain on a show that I think is spectacular yeah. with Grant, who is spectacular was awesome. Like, I did the happy dance. I did the book a job happy dance, maybe a little longer than usual. Um, I have a friend who is a huge fan of all of those stories, comic books, characters, etc. And he's like, "You're no way, you're King Shark." Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm like Shay Lambden. He's like, "Yeah, Shay Lambden, King Shark, dude, it's the same thing," you know. So, um, okay, yeah, right. And I'm like, "Yeah, I knew that. I knew that." Um, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, so it's been it was amazing, and. Yeah, the experience of being on a show like that and doing a character like that, I mean, it's unforgettable. I And the fan base and the people and the, and the way it was received, couldn't have, I couldn't have scripted it better. I had so much fun, even dipping in the ice cold I know. ocean. But you, you mentioned that he came up to you and said, are you sure you want to do this? Did you have a choice? Did, did you have an ability not to do it? Because I remember seeing you climbing out of that freezing uh, water uh, so was, was there an option of you not doing that? Because I would have chosen that option. <laughs> uh, again, remember how earlier on I said, I have trouble saying no. Yeah. Uh, 
they did offer. I mean, there's always the option of a stunt double. There was always that option. They could always shoot from the back and have somebody other than me climbing out of the freezing cold water. But they gave me the opportunity. And because of my stunt background history, yeah. I was given the opportunity and I jumped at it. I mean, it, I know directors and producers want to have the ability to not cut away from the yes. face of the actor to cover a stunt double doing something for you. So they were, they, you know, they were grateful that I was going to do it because it means I could come out of the water and they could follow it in a water and prove that it was me and not have to cut around it. And that's awesome. And then the stunt team there, those guys are, I've worked with them a lot. I, I actually did still work for Grodd and um, King Shark before I became King Shark. So nice. ironically, uh, so I knew them and they were, they were wonderful. They were phenomenal. I, I felt supported and comfortable and they had, a, you know, sneaky, sneaky. They had a hot tub on set for me. So after I came out of the ice cold water, I could dive in there and warm back up. Thank I you. actually have a photo of Grant poking his head in because a cast, a fellow cast member or somebody took a shot and he came over to say, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Are you okay? Like that's the kind of guy he is in his, freezing his butt off because it was winter in his uh, flash outfit, which yeah. it's not, yeah, it's not that it doesn't cover. <laughs> I, I can't imagine it being very warm, but it's just not normal that, uh, this, that the number one comes across through traffic, like through the human traffic bodies to go, Hey dude, are you all right? That was great. And like, yeah, man, thank you. Really go get warm. You know, like, wow. That's, that's very grand. Cool. Now, did you have to do many takes of that? Or hopefully that was just one of you of you having to jump in the water and then come back out? I think it was two. I had to dip my, I had to get in the water a couple of times, but okay. I think it was trying to um, wake my body up to what I was about to experience. <laughs> yeah. Like I had to acclimatize to some extent, because if you go in cold, it'll steal your breath. And what they wanted me to do is that there's a ladder and it was about, five foot into the water and they wanted me to hand bomb down to the bottom of the ladder, hold my breath as long as I could so that the water could flatten out from my entry mm -hmm. and then come busting out in a, in a, you know, the glorious rage of yeah. King shark to Shea land. And, um, yeah. So I think I held my breath for 0 0.001 of a second, um, at the bottom there, if I, at least that long, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, it worked. And I think, other than the acclimatizing dips into the water, I think we did it in one. I think. That's good. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to hear that anyway. That's, that's the thank God for that. Um, because you were mentioning in one of your interviews that, you know, the, uh, the stunt team told you, hey, we're going to put some water on your back. And you're like, no, no, I can, I can do it. And like, no, no, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill your breath. And I, I've never, you know, done, you know, cold water uh, or that type of a cold water. But I always climatize before I go into water because I know that about myself that it's 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 uh, going to do something with the breath. So I can't even imagine you know jumping into that uh, into that cold of a water. Well, I've done polar bear swims and done silly things, but I've never had to be a character and perform a scene and hit a mark. That's true. And that's I think the the genius of the stunt team was to say, yeah, you might have jumped into cold water and farted around, but it's it was at the freedom that you could come up screaming or jump out in two seconds and and you know not worry about what you look like or have to hit a mark or be a character. There's going to be I want to take this mental shift that's going to happen away from you, so let us splash some water on your back so that that aspect of it isn't influencing what you're about to do and you're not distracted mm -hmm. from what you need to do to tell the story and and that. You know, because I was more thinking like, holy crap, this is cold. Oh, my God, this is cold. Oh, my God. And then when they approved, I'm like, yeah, it's cold, but I got to be Shay Lambden. Okay, here we go. You know, it was nice. It was great. They're smart. Very cool. I like it. Um, all right. <clears throat> few more questions, and then I'm going to let you go because I've taken enough of your time already. I, I'm I, having fun, man. Thank you. I, I, I know you and I are enjoying this, but uh, I, I hear <laughs> from the viewers all the time. It's like, dude, how long can this be? And I don't I'm sorry. It. I don't get it. I'm a nerd. I want to listen to somebody for three hours. I don't care. I, this is this is what I enjoy. So I pray I'm not boring the living daylights out of people. So you're not absolutely not. Uh, and cool. you mentioned Grand Gustin, so I'm sure that gave them a you know, shot of <laughs> Um So I know that uh, again, you've you've done uh, photography, but uh, a lot of actors have to kind of do uh, hustle jobs. Uh, when you were kind of climbing the ladder. Uh, were you doing photography or what were some of your acting hustle jobs? 
Uh, so I wanted, to, when I was much younger and I wanted to keep my days free and I didn't have a family uh, to concern myself with supporting and being, um, honoring my time, I was a doorman at a bar uh, oh. at night and miserable existence. But again, you do what you have to do. I didn't, I was, again, I'll go back to how grateful and fortunate I know I am. It didn't have to do it very long before it started to be able to make a living as an actor. And then my side hustle jobs happened to be, well, not side hustle, but job related stunts. Like stunts was not necessarily the acting that I intended to do, but it was a part of the industry that paid well. That was something that I could do when I wasn't acting. So, and again, physicality and all that sort of lended towards that. So I could give up the dormant job pretty soon into my career here in Vancouver. Thank goodness. Um, yeah. I know they're essential, but it's just a tough, it's a tough go yeah. to be the fun police uh, type thing. Yeah. Get any, any fights? I know you were the doorman. You weren't necessarily the bouncer, but uh, get into any situations. Uh, there was, you know, there's obviously a couple of tussles here and there, but I prefer to be the guy who would talk his way out of everything and, and pray to God that I had enough charm to keep something diffused. Um, so, I mean, you know, like talk to a guy about, hey, man, you know, t tonight's not going so well. You, you, you end it tonight, you go home, you chill out, you figure things out, you come back, you get another chance to come back instead of getting banned. So let's let's work on making this work for everybody type of a thing versus uh, I'm going to punch you in the face. And then when you wake up, you can figure out why that wasn't good. I, I don't yeah. Not that that's how doorman roll. I'm just saying no, I've had my share of, of uh, skirmishes, but. Hey, you're you're just being a nice Canadian that uh, that you are. You're trying to talk your way instead of uh, you know bouncing somebody's head off. Um, I don't like getting hit either. <laughs> There's that. I know that's that's the thing with martial arts, right? I, I've done martial arts uh, and until I almost lost my eye when we were practicing knife drills, I finally said, you know what? I mean, I love this, but at some point, you know, is it really worth it and getting hit and doing all that stuff? And it's just not. So I didn't well, enjoy it very much. Yeah, I did martial arts as a kid, boxing on a to avoid or minimize the amount of getting hit part of stuff. So. Well, yeah, boxing you have to do a lot of bobbing and weaving in order to avoid getting hit, or at least somewhere somebody is going to hit you somewhere in boxing. It's going to happen. There's always somebody bigger, faster, stronger, right? Yes. Yeah. What I've learned in martial arts, and this is applies to life and acting in general, there are professionals, and then there are people who just do it because they think it's fun or they want to learn a few things. If you come up against the professional, just say sorry and go away. The, uh, because just one look, and, and I've been, I didn't spar with them, but I've seen when people were sparring, just the look in their face, and I already shed my pants. Just <laughs> <laughs> I think you gave me the best advice there. Even if you are bigger, tougher, stronger, faster, just say sorry and walk away. How important is it, right? Right. It's not, it's not worth it. I agree. Um, if, uh, as you're looking kind of at the landscape and hopefully this whole, you know, COVID thing uh, ends uh, very quickly and uh, we get back to some semblance of normal. Um, when you get back to that normal, is there a project out there, you know, big screen TV that you're looking at and saying, guys, I am perfect for this. I want to be a part of this. Why am I not a part of this? Is there one project like that right now? There's a few. I, I know. So I, they're doing a Reacher um, Jack series, and I, I desperately wanted. I, I didn't get my materials in in time, so I missed that boat. Uh, that would have been amazing. I, so I've submitted to Netflix for a series idea that is written to basically, you know, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, write my own stuff. Um, about a washed up athlete, mixed martial artist, uh, whose life's falling apart. Very ally. Californication um, type thing. And I, I, you know, that would be truly, that would be ideal is to, to have that series. I want to be on a series where I love what I'm doing, working with people that I adore, appreciate and respect. And uh, many of those would again, also be called friends. So that would be the ideal. So that, that, that series, I look forward to hearing from positive stuff from Netflix. I'm writing stuff with a buddy of mine, Carrie Dixon. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of features that I would love to do. There's, um, but on top of that, I, I would just, I'm still going to, maybe if this is close to wrapping up, but any day on set's a great day. So whatever job's coming, I'm, I'm in. I do, I would love to do sort of like a Bruce Willis, um, smart mouthed action hero. Um, yeah, I, 
there's so many options. There's so many things that I'd love to, I'd love to do. I, I even would love to do another Hallmark because they're about hope and love. And when I get approached at the grocery store by the wonderful lady who comes over and says, I know you and you did a great job. And I love those shows. And I love the, that's awesome to know that something you did translated to somebody and then be able to hear it from them. Cause you don't often, you know, I'm not in a position where I have adoring fans or paparazzi in any way, shape or form. So to get the lady at the grocery store, tell me that she loved what I did and loved that show. And it, her family loves them and it felt good. I, that's the biggest victory of all after the show's done to have that moment is so cool. It's, I always go home with this big goofy grin and my wife would be like, did someone recognize you? <laughs> and, you know, like it's a very specific look. I'll just come in like, huh? You know, <laughs> she's like, Oh, now what? No, I'm just kidding. I'm painting her in a bad picture. I hopefully I've given her enough credit. I'm joking. She just, She's equal. She, when I get recognized and she's with me, I can see out of the, I can see pride out of the corner of my eye when she's like, huh, cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Your wife is, your wife sounds uh, wonderful and amazing and supportive. So, you know, kudos. She is. She absolutely is. Very cool. Um, I love Hallmark, by the way. Like if, if uh, somebody was to ask me what would I want to do as an actor in the types of projects, Hallmark would be very close to the top of that list because I'm all about heart and love and joy and just, it's an energy thing. I want to be in the, in the movies where people can, you know, remove all of the drama uh, and just enjoy life and uh, come out of there smiling and joyful and happy and, you know, Hallmark. Even through struggle, right? There's, there's always an element of hope, which is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So very cool. The world needs more of that. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. The world absolutely could use more of that. Uh, last question. If you had a chance to, uh, to you know, uh, visit uh, uh, yourself after you got done with, uh, with Holland and your volleyball career and uh, give yourself one piece of acting advice for the future, what would that be? Uh, wow. Dropped that bomb on me, didn't you, Alan? Um, well played, sir. Well played. I... I I think that it took, for me, it took a long time to recognize the love of the journey as much as you need to in order to be successful. Uh, the thing that I tell my students that I think is something that I only, like the, let's call it wisdom, hopefully, that I gained over the course of years was that you don't go into an audition to book the role. You go in there to buy your tickets back into the room until it is your time. Because there's a million reasons why you won't get a job and only one real reason why you will because they choose you and it happens. So I think my focus when I was younger or maybe when I left pro sports, the one thing that didn't translate is, you know, getting the win, right? You, in sports, it's about a lot of times the W. Because yep. if, you, if you lose, your, your team loses. But acting, it's fairly individual in terms of the audition. And to me, as long as I put my absolute best effort forward and I can leave that audition saying there's nothing more I could do, I've done, I did my homework, I prepared, I tried to hone my process and awareness of my instrument to the point where I did the absolute best I could in that room, mm -hmm. then there's nothing left for me to do. And I can walk out going, waiting for, all I wait for is either wardrobe to call me or the next audition to come in. Yep. And that's, and that's something that I think if I had left or met myself back then that if I could impart that awareness of process and and um sorry not process so much as path focus that would have been great because the, then the break the heartbreak of not booking early or the the not doing well in auditions wouldn't have the same impact and i might have gotten to a better place a little sooner not that any road is better than any other one whatever lessons you learn along the way are obviously essential and ones you needed so did I answer that question, Alan? I don't know, but I talk a lot. And then I just at the end of it, I'm like, shut up, Dan. Well, I know how that feels, except for the last part, because I never shut up. Yeah, that's, that's, that's my wife's uh, thing to me. She has taught me over the, you know, 20, we've been married for 20 years, in November it would be 21, and we've been right. before. So for the, you know, more than half of my life that we've been together, uh, more than half? Yes. Wow. Okay. More than half of my life that we've been together, my wife has continuously taught me, hey, when you're around people, it's not just all about you. 
and you may want to hear and give somebody else an opportunity to speak. It's 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 um, slow, but I think at some point. <laughs> It's a balance I'm trying to learn as well. I know that when, we, when we're out, my wife's like, I also have opinions. So maybe you could let me share them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think if, if we get together, our wives are going to be making a lot of fun of us. Um, but that's, Rightly so. <laughs> that's, that's OK, and rightfully so. I agree. Uh, Dan, it's, it's such a pleasure having you on. I really love talking to another acting nerd uh, and somebody who has experienced all the things that you've experienced and still enjoys it just as much as you did before it's it's a real real pleasure thank you well i appreciate the opportunity to nerd out with a fellow nerd as well and i i say that proudly and i give that every positive notion it needs because it, it truly is a positive thing and i am i'm grateful for the path i've had and i hope it carries on i hope it i it will continue i'm going to pursue it with every ounce of my being so it will um for for people who are as open to it and as passionate about it and bring the right attitude to it as you, it will continue because that's that's why you're here. That's what you're doing. So it absolutely will continue. Thank you. Um, perfect. And thanks uh, to everybody for watching this. We really appreciate it. We know you're geeks just like us and you love acting as much as we do. And that's why we do this for you. Thank you. Thank you.